Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, like I say, we're a little bit late. We had a few um, technical problems. Um, some of you know, well, I think you all probably know me. I may have actually even re reviewed some of your work. Terry, I know. Catherine, I know we've already met. Adrian, I can't remember if we've already met or not. So apologies for that. But welcome to the, um, welcome to the workshop. It's very informal, okay? And it's just designed to give you a good idea of really how to get the best out of the course. So there's lots of different things that I've got in my mind that I think are important for students. But you know what? I'd like to be able to answer any questions that you've got as well. So if you can kind of pop them in the chat as we go um, and we can have a little look, I'll keep an eye on things as we're going. They've left me to run this for myself. So, well, that'll teach them, won't it? So you've either signed up for the AET which is the Award in Education and Training, or the AETA, which is the Award in Education and Training, but with the assessment um, theory module added on to it. Now, the first thing I'll say is that the, AT, the AET actually has an assessment module, um, Unit 3, but it doesn't go into quite as much detail as the one if you've taken the AETA option. In fact, the AETA option takes that unit from the assessment courses, so the CARVA, the Certificate in Assessing Vocational Achievement, or the Vocational Achievement Module, or the um, Occupational Competence. Don't worry too much about that. Both courses are essentially the same, and by the time you qualify, you have a Level 3 qualification in, um, or a Level 3 award in education and training, and you can use that alongside whatever qualifications you have in, in your other professional capacities, to teach in the adult learning uh, sector. So a lot of you have come to this because you want to increase your portfolio of skills and you really want to kind of come to terms with teaching in, in your environment, understanding what some of the core principles and practices of teaching are, but be able to relate them to your own environment. And I know there's you know, a variety of backgrounds for, for people that come and study this qualification. Some of you may be coming willingly and some of you may be coming slightly pressed because whoever it is that you work for or, or, um, or work with have said, actually, we now need you to have a formal qualification. Now, if you've been studying this for a little bit, you'll know that the qualification, both qualifications are made up of four modules. Three of them are pretty much theory related and the other one is very practical. We'll talk about the practical one separately, but the theory related models uh, modules, units one, two, and um, three, they all require the same approach. You've got to do some study, and we provide that material in the learning management system. It's all online. There's some videos, there's some quizzes, and there's actually the questions that you need to answer. There's also, um, in the resources section of each of your courses, there's some further re um, resources that you can use for research. For example, there's a recommended reading list and website. Now, what we provide in terms of background material, in theory, should be enough to get you through the qualification. However, there's a couple of reasons why you might want to step outside of our learning management system and do some research for yourself. One is that not everybody enjoys sitting in front of a computer and looking at videos and, and reading things. You know, so you might actually prefer to go and get yourself a book from, you know, Amazon or, or wherever, actually go into a bookshop. Who knows? I'm sure they still exist. and I'm sure we can still access them. Um, so it could be down to the way that you prefer to learn. Or it could be that um, actually for, for your own lifestyle, that it just makes sense to have a book. You know, if you're, if you're actually going into work, commuting or whatever, using the train or bus or or whatever, you can just sit and do a little bit of study while you're, um, you're traveling to and from work. So however you get the information is fine. And actually the other thing that we, we hope that people do is as they're exposed to some of the theories and some of the, some of the core principles of education and training, you're a little bit inspired to go and find out more because this qualification is pitched at a level three so it's probably not going to be the most demanding or challenging qualification that you've ever done in your professional career. That said, it is still a professional qualification recognised nationally and internationally. So the standard that we set is high. However, 
a lot of what is talked about in these qualifications, you could class it as common sense. For example, um, if we think about just good teaching practice, I don't know about you, but I like to get to know my students wherever possible. If you get to know them, you understand them, you can understand the motivation, you can understand some of the, um, the potential barriers that there may be to them learning with you and, and how you can help them overcome them. And it could be something fairly straightforward, like they just don't have a lot of time in the day, or it could be something a little bit more fundamental, maybe their understanding of English isn't, isn't that good, or what, whatever those barriers are, if you can understand them, you can help the student overcome them. Now, that's kind of common sense. Get to know your student, then you can help them in your role as a tutor. I'm willing to bet that at some point in your career, or possibly even before you left school, you'll have met a, student, a tutor who perhaps wasn't overly bothered about their students and didn't take the time or the trouble to get to know them. And therefore, your learning experience wasn't as positive. So, yes, a lot of what's talked about is common sense, but that doesn't mean to say that every single professional in the teaching environment applies that common sense and knowledge. So, I always look on this qualification as a cementing of what you already know. Some of you will have been teaching um, in, the, in your various sectors for some time. So we're going to pull together everything that you know, everything that you do. We'll put a formal structure around it in this part of the learning and the research that you're going to go through and help you understand the real importance. It might be that you do something instinctively and it works very well, but you have never quite thought about or perhaps understood why it works so well. Well, obviously, knowing why things are successful or uh, conversely not so successful is an important part of your own professional growth and, and development because you can try things by all means and we want people to try different approaches and, and different techniques even using different technology but you have to be able to evaluate how effective that was in a session learn from it and then move on again common sense but you would be amazed at how many people try something that doesn't work very well and keep going because well what else can I do? I can see no other way. So as you go through the qualification, you perform your studies. And then when it comes to answering the assignments, and I know some of you have already tackled this, it's really a matter of explaining the theory in your own words. So whatever that theory is, whatever the question has asked you to explain, question one in unit one of the AT, for example, says, hey, explain the five stages of the teaching uh, the, the, the teacher training cycle. Well, guess what you've got to answer? Five stages of the teacher training cycle. And really what we're looking for is, you know, a nice little summary paragraph on each one. Give a little bit of a, an overview as well as to where you're approaching this from. You know, what's your specialism? What do you think is important in terms of teaching? What skills? Um, what are the roles and responsibilities of the teacher? And make sure that you clearly identify those five stages, which are initial, You've got the planning, you've got the delivery, you have the assess and the evaluate. I'll give a little summary paragraph on each. And then the really important thing and what makes my job so enjoyable and so wonderful is when you relate it to your own area of specialism. And bearing in mind, we've got students from, well, we've got students from all over the world and we've got students in all different sorts of industries. These assessments, assignments and answers really come alive when you tell me what you're doing in your own area. So that's how to approach every single question. At the end of your answers, if you've done a bit of research to um, shore up your knowledge or, or, or think about things differently, we'd just like you to reference any sources that you've used using Harvard Referencing. And again, a guide to that is in the, um, in the resources section. Simple little, uh, simple little guide, what to do. And really, it's as straightforward as that. In my experience, and I've been doing this two and a half, three years now, most people struggle getting started. It can seem like an impossible mountain to climb. You're sat there faced with a whole bunch of learning to do. You've got other things going on in your life, work, family, and apparently there's a little bit of a crisis going on globally at the minute, which is no doubt um, upsetting the apple cart for everyone. Well, 
adding this extra dimension of teaching and learning into your um, into your life could be quite a big thing. Getting started is the single biggest favor you can do yourself. Just throw yourself in, get stuck into the course, start answering the questions. The very, very worst thing that can happen when you provide your answer for the first question is you go off point completely. You don't answer the, uh, the requirements. And guess what? I come back and I say, hey, let's have a little think about what you've done and I'll guide you back onto track. That's the worst that can happen. My experience is the first question, once you've committed some words to the uh, electronic paper and submitted it, you're going to be there or thereabouts. If you've read the question, if you've understood what it's asking you to do, you're going to be there or thereabouts in your answer. So any feedback that I will be giving you is relatively minimal. It might be, you know, well done on this. I love this explanation. More of this, please. Can you just add a little bit more on this point that you've made? You haven't expanded it enough. And trust me when I say this, I, I, I couldn't even begin to count how many assessments I've graded over that you know, relatively short period of time, pretty much everyone follows this pattern. In fact, what we're seeing more and more now is, especially with the new system, a lot of students are actually completing an assignment first time round. I go in, I review it, fantastic work. I will always, always tell you what I think has been really well done, because if you understand that, then you have a chance of applying it to the next submission. It's all about confidence, getting stuck in, seeing the positive results coming back, getting the positive feedback and then carrying on. Approach all three assignments in that way and you will not be far off of completing them. Do not try and do everything all in one go. Don't save it all till the end and throw yourself at it. Um, I know it's very tempting. Um, try and give yourself a little bit of space between submissions build up a bit of steady momentum. Don't sit down for a week and try and bash it all out because, well, you'll probably have a meltdown and you probably won't get the best out of this course in terms of really understanding the principles that we're trying to get across. Don't get me wrong, you will know a lot of this stuff, but we're really trying to inspire you to stretch your knowledge and stretch your understanding as well. Now, that's the three units um the three theory units has, has anyone got any questions on any of those if you've got anything just feel free to type it into the chat um i can't see any open questions or anything i know it's a bit difficult where you can't actually speak to me um and sort of pop up with questions i wish we had that facility and in fact i think i'm going to feed that back to um people at the other end who've, who've set this up for us the next thing I want to talk about, and I've got to be honest, it's the area that, that, that most people um, not struggle with exactly, but it, it's, it's the biggest mountain to climb, and it's the microteach. And there is a wicked irony in that it is probably the easiest unit to complete in this qualification. But it doesn't stop it being a little bit daunting for people until they understand what they've got to do. So this module is, is pretty much practical. It's gonna allow you to put into practice a lot of the theory that you've discussed in your, in your theory units. And we've split it into two clearly defined chunks, if you like. The first thing you've gotta do is watch three videos that have been um, created for previous students for their own microteach. So three videos, watch them 15 minutes long each, and you have to write some feedback. What we're looking for is for you to sit and watch these almost as a tutor. You know, what do you think went well? What do you think could be improved upon? And is there anything that you've picked up on that you could bring into your own teaching? Because an important part of being a teacher or a tutor is looking at what you do on a regular basis and kind of measuring it and saying well you know am i stacking up am i delivering what my students need am i being faithful to the curriculum to the course or can i mix it up a bit apart from anything else it makes it more interesting for you if you're delivering the same course in the same way day in day out you're very very quickly going to become bored jaded 
and, and of course people pick up on that so how can you look at other people's work draw inspiration find some ideas that you think might work or actually conversely find some things that well i'd never go near that i do a lot of training in in, in classroom well i used to do a lot of training in classroom and i'd work with some wonderful trainers absolutely wonderful people and they'd have their own style their own technique they deliver these courses and i just sit there and just be amazed and it's fantastic but what you've got to recognize is what works for one won't necessarily work for another person you know i i, I love humor in the classroom i love i love to be able to kind of laugh and and, and and make it a really light informal pleasant environment for people because i think when people are laughing they're enjoying themselves they're more likely to get something out of whatever it is that we're trying to do but you've got to recognize that when one person tells a joke and everybody laughs if i tried saying it it could well fall flat on its face so you've got to be able to kind of work out what's going to suit your personality your style and also adapt to the environment that you're in either the the, the students the subject possibly even your own mood um, i'm a bit of a showman i like to put on a bit of a show you may have worked that out already and so it's important for me to be able to move around and and actually make contact with the students you know go and stand next to them have a conversation whatever so online learning for me which is where all of my work has now gone has been a real challenge adapting my style to suit the online environment you would not believe right now i, I if i could if i were in the classroom doing this now i would be pacing around i'd be coming up to whoever was there and you know fantastic and you've already seen you know, i wave my hands a lot i'm quite animated but i've had to adapt my style so we want you to look at these videos write feedback and try and draw something from what you've seen, maybe inspire you to try something different in your own environment. The other thing about the three videos that we've chosen is that they're quite different subjects. I'm not gonna say what they are, but when you see them, it'll give you an idea of the range of skills and environments that our students operate in. It's really quite eye-opening. So I won't say any more on that, but you know, when you get to the point in which you're ready to watch them, go and have a look and, and, and be amazed. The other element is you've got to plan and deliver your own session. It's a 15 minute session, 15 minutes. So if you've been involved in teaching and training at any point in your professional career, 15 minutes with stu three students over the age of 18 is not going to be the biggest challenge that you've ever faced in your life. The reason we stick to 15 minutes is because this is an access to teaching qualification so you can approach it as an experienced professional with many many years in the classroom or this could be your first ever exposure to teaching and training and 15 minutes in that situation is a lifetime so we want to make this course accessible for everyone so the first thing you got to do is write your plan it's a 15 minute plan now interestingly just before i came online a student submitted a question to me saying hey tony I'm at the point now where I'm planning my session. You've provided a sample plan. Do I have to use that? Or can I use something that I use in my own environment? Now it so happens that this student is actually working in a teaching training environment. They've got their own plans. So my reply to her will be, if you've got a plan that exists and that's what you're gonna base your session on, then please use it. But remember it's 15 minutes only. A number of times I review plans and students have submitted a 30 minute or an hour session. And whilst that's real world, you know, I mean, a 15 minute session is, is going some, whilst it's real world, it's not the requirement for the course. Now, one thing to watch with the sample plan that we provide is it's a sample, it's a 30 minute plan, but it's just an example you have to take that plan and tailor it to your own needs. Now, 15 minutes, it goes in about three minutes. So when you're thinking about your plan, don't absolutely stuff it full of great, 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 great things because you will know if you're experienced that you're never gonna achieve your plan. But the other reason why we say 15 minutes, so, 15 minutes is a long time if you've never done teaching or training before so 
it's accessible for those very inexperienced people. But at the other end of the scale, because teaching effectively is about good planning, producing and delivering a 15 minute session, if you can do that, then you have demonstrated your ability to plan and deliver within time constraints to a very high level. Think of this, how many times have you been along to a session advertised as 15, 20 minutes, maybe an hour, and then an hour and a half later, you're still sat there going, well, when is this person ever gonna finish? You might be thinking that now, although this was advertised for an hour, folks. Um, you're still sat there an hour and a half later, and also they haven't even covered the reason that you went along. So the two big crimes in my book, in terms of teaching and learning is if you advertise a session that's going to be half an hour that session better be half an hour come in early people are going to think they've been robbed go over time and you've lost them because they've probably got somewhere else to be and something else to do and if in that allocated time you haven't talked about in any detail exactly what it was those people attended your session for then you've let them down all ways round. So 15 minutes is important because this is an exercise in your ability to plan and deliver to a schedule. Get your plan written. I take a look at it. I give you any feedback if it's needed. If it's all okay, I say crack on, get your session recorded. Now, the other thing that comes up quite often is people say, well, what, 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 what has my session got to be on? Anything. It doesn't have to be your workplace. I mean, if you're in a working environment, you might choose to base it on something, but bearing in mind, this is 15 minutes. I don't know of many workplace sessions that are actually only 15 minutes long. Most of you will be delivering sessions that are an hour, two hours, probably even half a day or a whole day. So that's a big ask to cut 15 minutes out. Why not get creative? You don't even have to be in a formal teaching environment. You could do a session to three friends. As long as they're over the age of 18, the requirement are, is three, three students over the age of 18. I'm not going to be there to observe it, although I do have to observe it. So you've got to be able to record the session. That's why having adults is important. So you record the session and then you attach it into the LMS for me to review. So the other important thing is I've got to be able to see you and I've got to be able to see the other three students because part of my assessment has to be the interaction between you and the students. Now, at the moment, a lot of us aren't going anywhere near a classroom or even having people around to your own house might feel uncomfortable or actually be against the government guidelines. So we're not saying you've got to put yourself or anyone else at any risk or even break any guidelines. If you want to do a session via Zoom or Google Meets or Microsoft Teams or any other software that you've got that allows you to record, and it allows you to, for your face and the faces of your students to be seen, that is fine. Some of the best sessions that I have witnessed, and you'll get a flavor for this from, from um, the videos that you're gonna see, have been people doing something that they enjoy and are really fired up about. So a couple of examples that spring to mind. Uh, a, a wonderful uh, gentleman decided to do a session on how to prepare and plant a lemon tree and he had his three friends and it was before covid so he all went round to his house set them all up on the kitchen table and he ran a really really lovely i guess you could call it a workshop really where he explained all the criteria to them first he'd sent them a fact sheet prior to saying bring these things along so they'd all come on well prepared talk to them a little bit about you know, the theory behind what they were going to do and then run a practical session where they all kind of prepared their lemon seed and actually got this thing planted and they had something to take away at the end of it. And it was brilliant. And it was really creative. And I have to say one that I'd never seen before. Um, I've watched um, a professional firefighter do a session for his colleagues. He was a training officer and within the fire service and, and within his shift. And his session, again, he... He did a session on how to recover a casualty using a high lift stretcher and a high lift stretcher is like a big shopping trolley cage type thing but no wheels and you get the you get the casualty into this thing strap them in and then you can lower them down from a high building or or actually from ground up to a helicopter to be fair 
and they're safe, they're, they're kind of protected by this metal cage. And the first session, the first bit of the session, seven minutes in the classroom, showed them how to prep the stretcher. I thought, this is really cool. He had his students and there was lots of Q&A going on and hands on and a bit of a demo. And then the session cut to outside and they were 90 foot up a tower. They had this dummy strapped in the stretcher and he was getting them to do the lowering. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And I'm not saying you've got to go out and be firefighters, folks. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying be creative. I've seen all sorts of sessions. We have a lot of people from the health and beauty industry. So I've seen um, how to prep, prep and do eyebrows and nails. I've seen waxing, live waxing. Very nervous looking student, I have to say. Um, I think it was the um, I think it was the sister of the person who was doing it. <laughs> well, fair play. Never involve your family. That's all I'm saying. Um, so really, you can be as creative as you like. Now, the micro teach itself, just to recap, 15 minute session, you've got to have a plan. You've got to deliver to that plan. Um, if you overrun slightly fine, I would say try not to underrun because you've probably cut something out or negated the value of the training. Once you've done the session, you get it recorded. I look at it. And then from there, you'll need to get some feedback from your students. There's, we provide forms, get, the, get one, each of your students to fill out the feedback and you have to complete a self-evaluation. So that's the course in itself. Now, we advertise this as how to get the best out of the course. If I was to summarize everything that I've talked about, first of all, when you're approaching the assignments, try and be inspired you may well find things that you hadn't actually come across before in terms of theory, um, you know, maybe Dale's kind of experience, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now Maslow, for example, someone well publicized, well documented this hierarchy of needs, but how does that relate to teaching and training? Have you ever considered that before? It could be something to do with the conscious competence model or whatever it is, you know, the formal theory, or it could just be, taking that formal theory and thinking about well, I wonder how I can apply this in my own teaching. Or I wonder how this manifests itself in my own teaching. And when it comes to the micro teach, have fun with it, try and enjoy it, try and own it. If you've never done any teaching before, it's a great little way to kind of cut your teeth. If you like to, to have a bit of a practice in a safe environment. And if you've done lots of this, then okay, your big challenge will be getting something down into that 15 minutes and sticking to it. So, has anyone got any questions? Because I do feel like I need to stop talking for a minute or two. I can't see anyone's uh, typed in anything in. If you go down to the bottom of the screen, there is the chat bar there. So if you want any, um, if you want to pop a question in the chat, please feel free. Um, nothing's coming up. I mean, the other thing is, if there's something that you don't think I've covered, you only need to email me. You know my email address, tony at eln.io. Fire me a message off either through the system or direct into my inbox. More than happy to either answer or if it's a little bit more involved or you want to chat to me about anything, please just let me know and we can arrange something. I know I've already spoken to Catherine. Um, and, and, you know, for me, it's nice to be able to meet you. We don't formally meet every single AET student. I've got quite a few on my, on my books, but if there is a need, if there's something that you, you, you want to ask me, you'd rather meet me face to face, that's absolutely fine. I really don't mind at all. As I say, it's one of the more enjoyable aspects of the job is meeting each and every one of you. Okay, so Adrian, Catherine, Terry, if you haven't got any questions, um, I think we can probably say cheerio. I'd just like to say thanks for coming along. If you're watching this online uh, after the event, I hope it's been useful. Same applies. Please get in touch if you've got any questions. And um, looking forward to seeing your submissions and seeing you on a course soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care. I'm going to end the call now. Thank you. Bye.